interest to see what that April 19th thing is all about. They're going to have live peeps and chicks. We might send them home with your kids. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's an honor to stand on this stage every week and to be able to share the gospel with, with all of you. It is a, it's a privilege I don't ever take for granted. It's something that I, I look forward to. It's something I esteem very highly. And I know what happens on Sunday is life change for all of us. I view this, this building as a hospital. I view what's happening here as an operating room. And it's something where, where life is hanging in the balance. And every Sunday, there's a lot of care and a lot of preparation, a lot of heart that goes in to what happens in these services. You're sitting in a seat. You're standing in the hallway. And the preparation for Sundays is something that's done by a lot of people to make what we do possible. And it's always humbling to be able to see God pull all these things together each and every week. From the food that you got to eat on your way in or even on your way out today, to the hot coffee you were served, to the big thumbs up as you walked in. You might pass on a high five for a few weeks. But the love that you see and feel here at One Oak Church is genuine and it comes from the Father. And today it is my privilege to stand on this stage and introduce you to somebody that I had the privilege of meeting 11 years ago. It was 11 years ago that my wife and I and our small family moved from Michigan to Houston, Texas to be youth pastors. We went to be youth pastors at a multi-campus church there and we're going to go lead. Lead a, a generation of world changers that we did not know. And so we understood stepping into this arena would be difficult, it would be hard. I'm 31, my wife was 28, 29 at the time, and we're a lot older, of course, than all the people we're leading. I immediately began to look through the audience of the young men and ladies that we were leading, and, and I connected with this young man. And I saw the potential within him just because of his charisma, because of his life, because of God's anointing on him. Anointing is the favor of God. Anointing is, is something that's set apart. And I saw what God had placed inside of him. The ability to speak was just one of his many talents, but his ability to bring people to church. There was one moment that in the time that we were student pastors, I watched as this young man led an entire school to our church on one Wednesday. It's no joke. Through the untimely death of one of our students in our church, who was closely connected to Byron, Byron began to rally the entire high school and said, we're going to honor the life of this young man and we're going to do it on a Wednesday night at my youth service. And I saw hundreds and thousands of people. There was hundreds of students. Their parents had to come. So they went to church in the big church that day. I'm telling you, it was packed. I've never seen a church so full than it was on that day because this young man had a heart to see his school and to see those closest to him see Jesus. And God did something great that day. And over the past several years, I've stayed connected with Byron. I've watched his life begin to flourish. I watched as his ministry began to grow. And I'm honored to have him as a brother today. I'm honored to have him as a friend. Byron would help me many times as being the youth pastor, Pastor Danielle and I being youth pastors there. And I didn't know Houston very well. Byron grew up in Houston. He said, Pastor Robbie, you can't go into that neighborhood. I said, why, Byron? He says, because you're too white. You can't go there. I'm like, well, you're going to have to go with me. He said, all right, I'm with you. I'm rolling with you. We're going to roll deep. I'm bringing all my friends with me. And Byron helped me a whole lot to be a better pastor, to be a better, better youth pastor, to be a better friend. And uh, I honor Byron. I thank God for him. And I got to sit in first service and hear the word that he has for all of you. And I want you to listen. Listen to what God is going to speak to your heart today. And when God speaks, respond. I wonder if you'd do me a favor today. Stand to your feet. Put your hands together. And welcome to this stage, Pastor Byron Rito. Come on, let's make some noise for Jesus Christ and what he's already done in this room. Come on. I am so very humbled um, to be with you guys this morning. Uh, 
Pastor Robbie tried to make me cry in the first service. He almost got me in the second. He got real close. Was, he got real close. Um, I'll definitely say that that story that he just told um, was was a turning point for me. I um, it's funny because the, the person that had passed away uh, was was a brother to me. I, I had known him. It was weird. We ended up realizing we were related. He, he lived across the street from me, and. Um, and in Texas, you know, you usually have like a lot of space. And so my family lived on five acres, it's a long story short, but this guy lived across the street from me, ended up being best friends. And um, he ended up passing away very suddenly. And so uh, we all kind of wanted to do something just to remember him and all kind of grieve together. So this particular night, Pastor Robbie allowed us to use this night to do that. But this night was our barf night, which was bring a real friend. And um, to, to bring my real friend and to celebrate his life and his coming home to Jesus um, was monumental. And uh, you guys don't understand, maybe some of you do, maybe some of you don't, you don't understand the, the, the privilege that you guys have to have Pastor Robbie and Miss Danielle as your pastors. It is a, it, it has been the, the joy of my life just, just to walk through um, my young high school, junior high, high school years and to be uh, groomed and gleaned by them um, I would not be on the stage if it wasn't for their leadership. So can you please give an honor and put your hands together for your pastors, Pastor Danielle and Robbie. So I honor you guys, and, and I, I truly do thank you. You guys can sit down. Going ahead. My name is Byron Rito, born and raised from Houston, Texas, and uh, I am just so thankful to be with you guys here this morning. Uh, it's going to be a great Sunday. I can't wait. Uh, now, I am a, I'm a country boy by heart, uh, straight from Texas, straight from the deep south, and so uh, if you guys want me to preach better and faster, I need your help. Uh, I need a little uh, amen. That's really good right there, or oh, I like that. He, he preaches something good right there, or, or oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's good. All right there, right there. Stay right there. Stay right there. I need, I need all of that. So if you would like for me to, I know we already lost an hour today um, because of, is it spring forward? Is that what it is? I know we already lost an hour. So if you guys help me, help you, help you, help me. And uh, we can, today's going to be a great Sunday, but um, I can't wait. Come on, go on and put your hands together. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I need. That's what I need. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just jump right into it. I'm going to be reading uh, from Isaiah 53.5. And uh, if you guys are taking notes today, I pray that you're taking notes. Uh, me and Pastor Robert both believe that note takers are world changers. And so if you want your family to change, if you want your life to change, um, whenever Pastor Robbie or myself or anybody comes onto the stage, we hope that we're not just speaking words, but we're speaking life to you. And so please be taking notes today. If you are taking notes, Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. Pause right here. As a young man, I'm 25 years old, and um, as I have continued to grow in my faith in Christ, I wanted to understand uh, the Bible a little bit more. So I thought, who other and who better than just to start at Jesus? And so as I started to understand a little bit more about Jesus, and, and I knew that he died on the cross, and, and I knew it was for me, but I don't think I really understood until this scripture that he was wounded because of what I did. I think that this scripture really does, and it helps me with this, and I love it because it comes from the Amplified Version, and there's a lot of different versions in the Bible, and this one really helped me understand that he was wounded for my transgressions, and he was crushed for my wickedness, for my sin, and my injustice, and for my wrongdoing, and the punishment required fell on him. Nobody else could pay the price except for Jesus Christ, and he took that debt and he paid it for me and you. And by his stripes, by his wounds, by the hurt of his body, we are healed. If you're taking notes today, the title of my sermon is When Deadly Wounds Turn Into Beautiful Scars. When deadly wounds turn into beautiful scars. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you so much for already meeting us here in this room. I want to thank you for the worship that we had this morning. I want to thank you for who you are and who you continue to be in our lives. God, I pray that you meet us here today. Do not pass us by. I pray that your Holy Spirit will come in like a rushing wind and set on us, God. We thank you for who you are and who you continue to be. Please do not let me get in the way from what you want to do this morning. Speak through me, God. It's going to be in your name we pray. Amen. So springtime in Texas uh, is a lot different than the springtime here in Detroit. Are we even in springtime yet? Because it's, 
It's cold. It's cold. Is it still a little bit of winter? Okay, cool. Because this is like super cold for Houston, Texas right now. Whenever Pastor Robbie asked me to come, he said, it's going to be a March. He said, you could probably expect about eh, kind of warm. It's kind of cold. I was like, what does that mean? He was like, uh, 30s to 40s. I'm like, that's ice. That's ice cold. I, I'm not handling that. I had to go buy a coat because I wasn't prepared. Uh, but springtime in, in Houston in, or in Texas is a lot different than springtime here in Detroit. Springtime in Texas, it's already 80 degrees. You know what I'm saying? And we got the, the tank weather. We got shorts on. It's also very humid. You step outside, you got to take a shower. No matter what, it, you're going to get dirty, right? And so in, in, in Texas, I, I loved the springtime as a kid because it wasn't too hot, wasn't too cold, but it was, it was right in the middle, right? And I would love to go outside and play with my friends. One of the, the, one of the highlights of my childhood was in the neighborhood that I grew up, right uh, in Houston, Texas. And we would go out, we'd play football and basketball and ride our bikes and climb trees and, and drive you know, ATVs and all kind of, all the cool stuff you could do as a kid. One of the things I realized growing up is that no matter how hard I tried, no matter how dedicated I was, no matter how many uh, shoulder pads or elbow pads or knee pads I wear, I was going to get hurt. No matter what. Playing basketball, somebody dunk on me, I get hurt. Playing football, somebody tackle me, I get hurt. Climbing a tree, scrape my knee, I get hurt. No, but in order to kind of go through life, I just kind of realized, no matter what, mom, I'm going to come on with a bruise, get the Band-Aid ready. Doesn't matter what's going to happen. And so one of the, probably the, the, the most gruesome story of me as a kid and me getting hurt was the story right here. I'm just going to tell you guys straight from the jump. I got hit with a hammer. I'm just going to tell you guys what happened. We're going to go through the story together. All right, we're just going to go through it together. So I'm five years old. And, um, and my sister is around seven or eight. And uh, she is uh, in the, the hallway that leads to the kitchen. And there's just a little hallway that gets to the kitchen. And I grew up with, there's six brothers and sisters. There's six of us total. And so there's a lot of kids already in the house. I don't know why. I'm in the middle. So I have an older sister who's almost pretty much the oldest. And she's a dumb one. And so she's swinging this hammer around in a circle. And she's just, ah! Swing this hammer around as I don't understand women. And uh, she swing this hammer and, you know, me and my, and my mature five-year-old, you know, voice. I'm like, sister, can you please stop swinging this hammer so I can continue my pathway through to the kitchen? And she doesn't. And she's like, no, just I'm swinging this hammer. I'm just swinging it. You know, just crazy. So I'm thinking, all right, cool. She's not going to stop. Let me just go underneath her and then I'll get to the kitchen, right? Smart. <laughs> so I get underneath there, I dip down, I go underneath, and I just come up a little bit too soon. And the edge of the hammer that takes the, the nails out, you know, from the, yeah, got me, right in the head. And I pass out, there's, you know, blood everywhere and all kind of stuff. I had to get rushed to the hospital, got the stitches and things like that. And so now, even today, every now and again, I could touch right here and I can still feel the scar that was left from that gruesome womb. And I just realized as I got older, it doesn't matter what's going to happen. It doesn't matter if my crazy sister is in the kitchen or not, swinging a hammer. I'm just going to get hurt. Okay? It's just, it's just how it is. Six brothers and sisters, you're going to get hurt. And I realized that even in our lives today, that as we continue to go through life, as we continue to live, as we continue to get older, Spiritually, emotionally, socially, we're going to get hurt. We're going to get wounded from a loved one, from a family member, from people at our job, from, from people that we don't even know. Accidents happen. Things happen in our life, and we get hurt. It could be from our jobs, from our children, from our loved ones. doesn't matter. At some point, you will get wounded. The Bible says in John 10.10 10, that a thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and everything in abundance more than you expected. Life in its fullness until you overflow. What I realized from this scripture is that the devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Doesn't mean that he really can steal, kill, and destroy. I know some people are like, oh my goodness, woe is me. And uh, like, oh, the devil keeps it. No, it's, it doesn't really happen just like that. He, he wants to. Doesn't mean that he can't. I want a Lamborghini. Doesn't mean I can get it. All right. I want to date Jennifer Lopez. That's just me. Don't know about you guys. 51 years old. Come on. Let's make it happen. Kids and all. We'll just take them all in. Doesn't mean that I can't. Doesn't mean that I have the access or the ability 
to go and to do so. There is one thing that the enemy can do with, tempt- with temptation and with sin. There is one thing he can do, and that is wound us. The enemy will try to hit us with a right and then hit us with a left and then hit us in different areas of our life. And he will try his hardest. And he'll keep trying and he'll keep trying until he wounds us to death. That is the one thing that the enemy can do. He can wound us so severely if we don't find healing that will continue to knock us out. We'll be going through life and we'll have a spiritual limp and we won't even know why. We'll, we'll bleed all over and we won't even know. And we'll realize, oh snap, I'm, I'm wounded. And I didn't even realize that the enemy swept in and started to kill, steal, and destroy in different areas of my life because I was wounded and I, and I didn't find that healing. He will try to wound you and attack you. He will hit you with problem after problem after problem. The devil's intent is to deliver a deadly wound until he wounds you to death. The enemy will try to hit you with a deadly wound, and that a wound that will kill your soul, a wound that will kill your worship, That'll kill your praise. That'll kill your joy. That'll kill your faith. He doesn't care if you have no relationship with God or if you've been walking with God for 50 years. I know some of my seasoned saints in here can testify that the enemy does not fight fair. He will hit you with everything that he has until you give up. Until you say, you know what? I quit. It was too much for me to handle. I couldn't do this any longer. I had to give up. I'm running to something else. I'm done with the Jesus thing. I'm out of here. As a young man... It's been hard for me to detect, not if, but when and where and what areas of my life the enemy was actually going to hit. I didn't realize that when Pastor Robbie and Danielle were going to come to our church, that they were going to completely change my life. I didn't realize that. I, I thought that at age six, I knew everything I knew about God. That's why I got saved. I was like, you know what? Age six, yes, children, Pastor. I know exactly what you're talking about. Jonah, I love God. Let's do this. Let's make it happen, right? Come on. Then I got to 10 years old, and I realized, ah, man, those last four years of my life are pretty rocky. I don't, I don't know what I was doing those last four years, but now is my time, God. I'm running to the Father again and again, right? This is, this is, and then you get to age 13 and 14, and then you're like, ah, man, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I really have a decision. And then finally, Pastor Robbie and Daniel walk into our church, and then they started to teach me about the Holy Spirit started to teach me about the power of grace and of love and of hope. And then I realized, oh, that's, that's what a relationship with God looks like. So then I finally decided, decided to go and give my life to Christ. And that is when I started to see the enemy wound me in different areas, taking my best friend away from me, wounding me. Hurts and different things in my life wounded me. My, my, one of my siblings, uh, one of my brothers is, is, is just not wanting to live for Christ. That, that, that's been wounding me lately. I, I realized that the enemy just, he just, he just tried to hit me. What, what's so crazy is that if he can't get you, then he'll try to get your marriage. And if he can't get your marriage, he'll try to get your kids. And if he can't get your kids, then he'll try to get your business. And then on and then on and on. I realize that the enemy does not fight fair and he'll do anything he can to throw anybody off course and throw anybody off and being wounded to death. There's a story about a young man and a girl and they were madly in love. When I say madly in love, they were like in love, in love. They met at a young age. He was 18. She was 16. Fell in love. They decided to get married. 22 and 20, right? They know everything. They got it in the bag. They're good. Marriage. Woo! Amazing. They were what people would call, or what young people would call, like, relationship goals. They had a picture-perfect Instagram couple. They, uh, they're going through life. They're doing ministry together. This is what people would think that a good, wholesome, amazing young marriage would look like. And then one day, after three years of being married, the wife goes and looks at her husband and says, hey, actually... I don't want to be married anymore. She packs up her things, sends the divorce papers in the mail, and leaves. And now the husband is is sitting there, and she's just woken up and told him what happened, and now he doesn't even want to get out of bed. And thoughts of depression and thoughts of suicide started to hit in his mind, and then he realized, oh, snap, I'm, I'm wounded. And as he started to try to figure out how to navigate through life and how to, how to continue to go. He, he didn't realize that the wound started to infect different areas of his life, his mental process and how he thought about God and how he started to love people. And then at one point, he thought, you know what, it's just time for me to give up. The devil has wounded me in an area that I can't face. 
He has hit me so hard. He has hit me at my core. He's taken the one thing that I thought God actually gave me. The Bible said, let no man separate what God has put together. I didn't even know that man could actually separate this. I didn't know that that was a thing. And so the man started to give up. But as soon as you start to give up, I promise you there's a scripture for you. He's crying out, my heart is broken and I don't know what to do. Can somebody please heal my wounds? And then Psalms 147.3 says, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. That is my story. That's been the last couple of years of my life. And as I'm crying in my bed and as I'm weeping, filled with anxiety and depression and not knowing what to do, I turn to 147.3 in Psalms and I realize that he is going to heal my heart. And God is going to bind up my wounds because of what he did on the cross and because of the wounds that he had for me. Let's make some noise for Jesus Christ. I came to encourage your wounds this morning. If you have been hurt, if you've been wounded, there is healing in the room this morning. You don't have to walk around hurt or bruised or feeling like you can't make it. The Holy Spirit is here and he wants to heal your soul. He wants to heal your heart. Healing is a must. The enemy wants to wound you to death. But he also knows that if he can get you from healing those wounds, then the same way Jesus was healed after those wounds. You will have the same effect Jesus had after he was healed. Let me explain that. When Jesus rose from the dead and he goes into the upper room, a room that was locked, filled with his closest friends, they didn't even recognize him. And they're going through like, who in the heck is this ghost that just walked through this room? What is happening? Oh my goodness, somebody called Ghostbusters. And they go in and they go, oh, is that, is that Jesus? And they start to believe, but then there was one person, Thomas, that said, no, nah, I ain't, ain't no Jesus. That boy, I tell him, I ain't, ain't no Jesus. I saw Jesus. He died. No, 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 no. I, I saw him. He went through a divorce. There's no way he's healthy. No, no, no. I saw them. They were battling with depression and suicide. There's no way they made it. No, 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 no. That, that girl who, she had anxiety. No, no, no. Remember, she had an abortion. There's no way God is using her. There's no way. And what Jesus did is what we should all do this morning is he pulls up his sleeves and he says, you can't deny my scars. Whew. You can't deny the wounds that I had, the ugly wounds I had and how my heavenly father turned them into beautiful scars. You can't deny the stripes that are on my back. You can't deny the hole that is still left in my side. As I was reading the story, I was like, God, why? Why is it that your heavenly son, the son you sit down to die for us, you, he, you raised him from the dead. He defeated death, hell, and the, and the grave. The veil is torn. He has the keys to hell. Why is it that when he came back on the third day, he didn't come back with a perfect body? His body wasn't all ripped like Pastor Robbie's. You know, it wasn't. Wasn't chiseled, and he wasn't like me, Jesus Christo. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't, wasn't nothing like that. He didn't walk with a little limp, like I defeated death, hell, in the grave. You know what I'm saying? But, but still, he he had the hole in his side. He had the the holes in his in his hands, and and the holes in his feet, and the and the holes in his in his skull from where they placed the thorns, and he had the stripes on his back. God, why? Why is that? And I realized that God left the scars to remind us of the healing power that Jesus actually went through. If Jesus wasn't left with the scars, how would we know that he was actually healed? How would we, how would we know this wasn't somebody else? How would we, how would we know that, that this isn't some random guy that just walked into it? How would we know? Because you can't deny a scar. You can't deny what I went through. You can't tell me anything otherwise. I, I know Jesus healed me because I still have the scar to prove it. I realized that only God can take an ugly wound and turn it into a beautiful scar. I realized that only God can turn my hurt and my pain and use it 
for a testimony. Jesus' scar became a testimony of God's ability to heal. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was completely healed of his wounds, but the scar still remained. The problem with the church today is that we want complete restoration of what we went through so that when people see us, they think they have no idea of what the hell that we actually walked through. We want the picture-perfect life, the picture-perfect Instagram, the picture-perfect business. My business has never gone under. We're amazing. Me and Sally, we've been married for 50 years. We've never had a problem in our lives. 27 kids in all, every single one of them, perfect. No, 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 actually, we married for 50 years, but it was a struggle getting here. Yes, all my kids are amazing, but there's still some that are still on drugs, and there's still some that are on alcohol, and there's still some that are going through marriage problems, but I know God's going to heal them too. I, I know God's going to heal them too. That's the stories that we need in the church. That's the stories that we need to hear. That's the power that I love about One Oak Church is that this is a place of transparency. This is a place that you can come in. You can get signed up in a connect group. You can say, I'm wounded, but I know God can heal me. I've been through something, but I know God can heal me. That's the power that God and that Jesus and that the Holy Spirit left us with. Stop covering up your scars. Your scars are a reminder of what you have been healed from. Wear your scars as a badge of honor. The scars prove how bad it was at one point and how good it is right now. I'd be a fool to walk around and act like I've never been through a divorce. I'd be a fool to walk around and act like I've never battled with depression. I'd be a fool to walk around and act like I've never battled with anxiety. I'd be a fool to act like I've never had suicidal thoughts. I'd be a fool to take away the miracle that Jesus did in my life. I'd be a fool. I'd be a fool to act like Jesus hasn't healed my heart and my soul and has brought me back to praise and worship. I'd be a fool. You see my scars? My scars are a reminder that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Because I serve a God who heals deadly wounds and turn them into beautiful scars. Can we make some noise again for Jesus Christ? The doctors say that there are two things that you need to heal a scar. Number one is you have to leave or le uh, heal a wound. I apologize. You have to leave a wound uncovered for it to help stay dry, and that helps it to heal. So if you get cut, if you get wounded, you have to leave the wound uncovered and let it air dry. What I love about that, I love about the air, a lot of people, a lot of ministers, they always say that the air kind of reminds them of just the Holy Spirit and the wind that comes through. So let the, let the Holy Spirit brush up against those wounds a little bit. Let it air dry. And number two, bleeding helps the wound to heal. So number one, stop covering up your wounds. And number two, let the blood flow out of it. And what I love about what Jesus did on the cross is that because of the blood he shed for us, it's the same blood that flows through me. And so when I let the blood flow, I'm letting the blood of Jesus Christ just come on through me. And I'm letting him say, Jesus, just heal my heart. Just, just heal my wounds, God. Turn them, turn them into scars. Let me remember about what you did. I don't, I don't want to be stuck in this whole mindset. I want to I wanna be healed because of what you did. Isaiah 30, 26 says, moonlight will shine as bright as the sunlight, and the sun's glare will become seven times brighter, like the light of seven days rolled into one. That will be the day when the Lord, our God, Yahweh, heals the bruises and wounds that he, the enemy, has inflicted. God said, your night will become like day, and your day seven times brighter when you let me heal your wounds. My wounds affected me, but they did not infect me. Do not become addicted to your wounds, but instead embrace your scars. This morning, it's time to embrace the scars. It's time to embrace the healing power of the Holy Spirit. It's time to let go of those bandages and let God come in and heal those areas of your life. I'm going to leave you guys with this. Because of what I went through, because of my story and, and how God has brought me through, I recently just wanted to sit down and talk to my grandmother. My grandmother is 81 years old. Amazing. She became a widow at a young age. And 
is a two-time cancer survivor. Come on, let's make some noise for that. She has been through many a wounds, spiritual, emotional, and physical. She has been through a lot. And during her second battle with breast cancer, I remember that the doctors actually had to remove one of her breasts. And I remember seeing the scar that was left behind. And I remember being so sad for her. And I remember just being like, just, just hurting for her. So recently, we're just sitting down talking, eating gumbo. That's what we do in Texas. And I said, Grammy, call her Grammy. Can you please explain to me how you do it? 81 years old, widow at a young age, had to raise four kids pretty much by yourself. Two-time cancer survivor. 800 grandkids, I'm sure. Leader in your community. She also has like, uh, one of her legs are a little bit shorter than the other, so she has like a little limp. Amazing cheerleader in high school and in college. How'd you do it? How did you, how did you continue to thrive and survive? How do you wake up every single morning and not battle with anxiety or depression? How do you continue to thrive in your community and, and with your family? What, what do you do? How are you still mentally stable? And my grandmother, all five feet tall, gray hair, 81 years old, said, baby, my identity is not in my wounds. My identity is not in me being a widow. My identity is not in me being a two-time cancer survivor, but my identity is in the one who healed me once I became a widow. My identity is in the one who healed me from breast cancer twice. My identity is in the one who healed my wounds and turned them into beautiful scars. So this morning, I'm here to tell you, you are not your wounds. You're also not your scars. But your identity is in the one who turned those wounds into beautiful scars. Your identity is in the one who laid down his life for you. Your identity is in the one who took his wounds and said, now I can turn your wounds into beautiful scars. Your identity is in the one Savior and the one Jesus Christ and the one who laid down his life for you. Can we please put our hands together for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for what he did on the cross, not just for me, but for you. It was the wounds that turned into scars. How do I know? If I'm being healed from my wounds, when they start to look like scars. What I love about One Oak, and what I love about the moment that we have this week and next week is that you guys actually have connect groups starting next week. And so one of the ways you can start to find healing is in a connect group. It's funny because churches all over the world do connect group and a lot of people, sometimes people don't want to go. If, never, if you've gone before, you continue to go. If you've never gone before, you don't know what you're missing out on. Because there's moments where people will say, hey, can I just attest to something? I just want to tell somebody something. Me and my wife, we were going through a lot, but God healed us. He can heal you too. Scar. You know what? Actually, I, um, I almost took my life one time and had the peels in my hand and and I, and I thought about doing it, but then God healed my heart and my mind. Scar. You know what? Actually, my, my kids, they, um, all of them, they were, they were running out. They were not doing what they're supposed to do. But God has healed all of them, and, and I have the scar to prove it. Scar. That's the power of your testimony. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of going through something and coming out on the other side. What I love about Jesus is that his three years of ministry was amazing can't deny it the healing and the power and what he did in those three years but nothing was compared to what Jesus was until after he was wounded until after he came off the cross until he rose again on that third day and you saw the wounds that Jesus went through then the power of the Holy Spirit came so what I'm here to tell you this morning is that you've been waiting on the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and now is the time where the healing process is going to start for your wounds turning into scars. And now the healing power of the Holy Spirit that was on Jesus is on you now this morning. And now you're able to realize that if I'm able to walk through what I can walk through. And if I'm able to come out on the other side, I can say, devil, 
You tried. You tried to hurt me. You tried to wound me. You tried to take me out. You tried to take my life, but I have the scars to prove it. I have the scars to prove that I was healed by Jesus. I have the scars to prove that I was healed by the Holy Spirit. Can we make some noise for the healing power of Jesus, for the healing power of the Holy Spirit that is on us today? For we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. We overcome by the blood of Jesus and what he did. And we overcome by the testimony of our scars. I leave you with these three points if we're taking notes. Number one, stick to what you know. Remind yourself of God's healing power. Remind yourself of what he healed you from. Remind yourself of what you know. He's the answer prayers that he has in your life and the personal history that you have with him. These things can quiet the raging questions that doubts that flood your mind. Number two, show your scars. Remembering what Jesus did for you and also what he healed you from. Connect with somebody in a connect group. Scars are a reminder of what God brought you through. And only God can take an ugly wound and turn it into a beautiful scar. Number three, seek God's face. Above all else, seek God's face. Go after him with your own heart. Lean not on your own understanding. But in all things, seek God's face. When you don't know what to do, seek God's face. When depression hits you, seek God's face. When anxiety comes, seek God's face. When loneliness and fear comes, seek God's face. How do you do that? You worship. You get on your hands and knees and you worship. You go to a quiet place in your house and you worship. I like to go in my car and blast music and I worship. No matter what happens in your life, no matter how the wounds come, I promise you there's healing on the other side. So this morning, this is what we want to do with every eye closed and every head bowed. I want to ask you a question. This morning, if you would like to start the healing process for those wounds, this morning, if you're saying, hey, that, that's me, I'm, I'm ready for the Holy Spirit to come in and start to heal these areas of my life. On the count of three, I would love for you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. Why? Because one, you're taking a step of faith and saying, that's me, I'm ready for healing. And as you stretch your hands to God, I believe he's stretching his hands back down to you. One, right now in this moment, Holy Spirit, I pray that you come like a rushing wind. I pray that you come like never before. And I pray that this morning will start the healing process for all of us in this room. Two, right now is the moment. And right now is the time where we can run back to the Father. No matter how many times it's been, it could be again and again and again. And even if we've been praying this prayer before, I pray that in this moment, our healing process will start. And you will start to turn our ugly wounds into beautiful scars. One, two, three. Raise your hand if you're ready to receive healing right now. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Father, I pray for the healing power of your Holy Spirit to come in this room. God, I pray for the healing power of the Holy Spirit to come like a rushing wind and touch every heart and every soul and every mind and every body. No, you will not have any suicide right here in One Oak Church. No, you will not have depression in One Oak Church. No, you cannot have anxiety in One Oak Church. But as these people have raised their hands to you, I pray that your healing power is reaching right back down to them. Every wound will be a scar today. And we will remind ourselves of what you did in our life. I pray, God, that you continue to come like a rushing wind and like never before. Right now, there is healing. Right now, there is hope. Right now, there is grace. Right now, there is victory. Right now, anxiety has to leave. Right now, depression has to leave. Right now, loneliness has to leave. Right now, anxiety has to leave. Right now, depression has to leave. And the healing power of the Holy Spirit is going to come like a rushing wind. I pray for restoration of marriages. I pray for restoration of souls. I pray for restoration of hearts. I pray for restoration of minds and of bodies. Jesus, it is your church. Jesus, this is your city. And you can have your way in this room this morning. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. And the worship team is going to...